Well, brothers and sisters, as I mentioned, today is um, Christ the King Sunday, and so we are focusing our, our, our thoughts and our, um, our message on uh, this reality that Christ is, is not just our Savior, that Jesus Christ is not just our Savior, He is also our King and Lord. And that may be a little bit foreign to us because although we have a queen, she does not serve really in the same capacity that a king would have done in the days of Jesus' life on earth or in the days of Israel preceding that. Um, queen Elizabeth II is not like, in a lot of ways, uh, King David was. Um, things have changed, and essentially we live in a democratic-ish sort of society. But that being said, it is important for us to recognize Christ's kingship and all that that means for us. And so I would invite you to look with me first at Daniel chapter 7. We'll look at Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 10 and 13 to 14. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 10 and 13 to 14. And this gives us an image of Christ's sovereignty, of Christ's kingship that fits in some ways with our own images of earthly kings, although infinitely so much more. And so let us look at this passage. This is Daniel receiving a vision, of course. And he says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days, that is uh, the title of one of the many titles of God the Father, the Ancient of Days took his his clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. Just to pause there for a minute. Uh, part of this, you can see where a little bit of the stereotypical image of God the Father comes from in this passage, right? The, the image of the white-haired God sitting enthroned on high with, you know, maybe his eyes flaming and, and, and so on, right? But remember that this is not the same, even though there's some imagery that is the same, this is not the same as the stereotype that we often see in popular media because that's all mixed up with images of Zeus and, and wrath and anger. And, and it is certainly true that God has righteous wrath and anger at times, but it's not the same as like Zeus who was like really kind of weird and petty and, and terrible. Okay? Just be aware. Okay, And then secondly, we should be aware of this whole wheels thing, right? Um, his throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. This harkens a, a little bit to other visions that are in the scriptures of God's throne having wheels. Um, not like a wheelchair, um, but, but sort of these huge wheels that have eyes all around them, and they symbolically indicate the omnipresence and the omniscience of God. That God can be and is everywhere at once. That's the mobility, as it were. And that God sees and knows all things at once. Right? And so these wheels, whether God's throne literally has wheels or not, We'll just wait and see. But the wheels there are indicating something important about who God is. That God can see all and knows all, all at once, and He is everywhere at once. In other words, God is sovereign, right? Moving on, verse 10. A river of 
fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. In my vision at night, Daniel continues, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him, his dominion, is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The Word of the Lord. There are a couple of important things to really be aware of there. Oh, I should have said Amen. Amen. I'm also thankful for the Word of the Lord. Um, there are some really important things there. Notice the awesome power and the, the sovereignty of the Almighty, the Ancient of Days, right? This vision that Daniel sees is not one that is small, right? There is this God who is robed in white and hair of wool and sitting on a, th a flaming throne with wheels that indicate His omniscience and His omnipresence and the fire that flows out like a river from His throne is an indicator of His widespread power and influence. The flames of the throne also showing His power. So our God is indicated right here as being omniscient and omnipresent and omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere at once. And this God has thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people attending to Him. And they're, they're not doing so simply because they are compelled to do so by, by slavery or something foolish like that. They are rightly and properly attending to God, the Ancient of Days, who deserves, appropriately so, all this glory and honor and power. This is not a small thing. All the peoples of the universe properly owe their allegiance to Him. And then in comes the one looking like a son of man. And this is very interesting. Of course, Daniel lived hundreds upon hundreds of years before Jesus was born, before the incarnation happened. And yet, here comes this figure looking like a son of man. And, and if that's not a testament to the, 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 the humanity and the deity of God in Jesus Christ all at once, I don't know what is. But here comes Jesus, essentially, although Daniel didn't have that name for Him. Here comes Jesus approaching the throne. And, and what happens? What happens? But God, the Ancient of Days, the Lord of all, the One who has all the power, all the authority, all the knowledge, everything, He gives all of that to Jesus. This is what it says. Verse 14. He was given all authority, glory, and sovereign power. Excuse me. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is our God. 
This is the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Father together in the throne room of heaven. This is the King whom we serve. And yet now we must look at the other passage for today, and that is the Gospel of John. And so I would invite you to turn with me to John chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. John chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. And you'll know some of this because we read it already for our time of confession But listen and think of the contrast between this image and the image that we just received from Daniel. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. The word of the Lord. Amen. What a contrast. What a contrast. On the one hand, this this peek into the heavenly throne room and all the power and all the glory and all the sovereignty and, and all the thousands upon thousands rightly doing homage to their King. And, and on the other hand, a, a, a human being who's already had an awfully rough night standing seemingly, perhaps, pathetically before the governor who holds his life in his hands. And yet, there is far more to that image than just one lonely human being standing before a governor. What we see in Pilate's palace is no less a king than who we see in God's throne room in Daniel. Listen to one of the or listen to some of the responsibilities of a king according to Erdman's Bible dictionary when talking about king's responsibilities in Old Testament Israel and and these things will sound familiar because they they are similar to what we would think a king or queen would be responsible for. A king's responsibilities are to raise an army, to collect taxes, uh, to conscript for government service of various types, to administer civil, military, and religious affairs, to do domestic infrastructure building. Think of Solomon and the temple, for example to deal with diplomatic relations, to take care of international trade, to be the final appeal of justice and to ensure that justice is taking place throughout the kingdom. And most importantly in Israel, the king was the key in the relationship, the covenant relationship between God and His people. Raising an army, collecting taxes, conscription for government service, administering civil, military, and religious affairs, building infrastructure, 
diplomatic relations, international trade, justice, and divine covenant. So what is Jesus doing in John chapter 18? Standing there before Pilate. And what was He doing in His life? Because certainly, and, and according to the Jews of His day, many of them, it didn't look like Jesus was behaving much like a king. But is that really true? Well, think about it. Jesus spends the three years or so of His public ministry raising an army and conscripting people for government service in His kingdom. Who else? would the apostles be? Who else would all of His disciples and followers be if not an army and conscripts conscripts for His service and government? What else is Jesus doing but engaging in diplomatic relations right now with Pilate, the governor of this area? Sure. Sure. Things don't appear to go all that well for Jesus. But you could certainly see this as diplomatic relations. Building infrastructure. What else is Jesus doing during this time other than establishing His church? And what else is the church but the infrastructure for completing Jesus' mission in this world? Jesus is being the King. As for paying the taxes, well, Jesus does that Himself for us. Paying the taxes. And enacting justice, well, He does that for us too. Taking what we owe upon Himself. And most of all, Jesus is submitting to the divine covenant as the key in our relationship with God. It is no wonder that Daniel sees Jesus given all authority and glory and power. It is no wonder that Jesus' kingdom shall reign forever. It is no wonder at all that we owe Him everything. See, that is why Even though Daniel's vision comes hundreds of years before Jesus' incarnation, Daniel's vision is a result of the consequences of what Jesus does here in John. Jesus is the King. He is our King. And He has claimed us. So what? Our loyalty belongs to one person. Our loyalty does not belong to Canada. I know it is so popular to be patriotic these days. To say, yay USA, or yay Canada, or whatever your country is. But it's not what we are called to do. I mean, we don't have to be subverting the country of Canada, but we don't need to be loyal to Canada. We need to be loyal to God our King who is sovereign over us. Our kingdom, too, is no longer of this world. Primarily, you are not Dutch. Primarily, you are not Canadian. Primarily, you are not even a Zalstra or a De Young or a Verberg. Primarily, you are a son or daughter of God. 
a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And in some very real ways, who cares about Canada? Except insofar as our king commands us to care for Canada. You see? Right? This is, this is true on so many levels. Our, ultimately, our ultimate loyalty belongs to Jesus, not to Canada, not to our neighbors, not even to our spouses. Our ultimate loyalty does not belong to our children or to charitable organizations or, or to companies or sports teams or entertainment things or anything like that. Our ultimate loyalty belongs only to one. And that is Jesus. That is why Jesus Himself says something along the lines of, if you don't despise your family and your neighbors for Me, then you are not part of My kingdom. Not because we inherently must despise everybody around us. Jesus clearly teaches us that we are to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. The problem comes in when we have a loyalty that supersedes our loyalty to God. If I am more loyal to my wife than I am to God, there's a real problem. And the world will tell us that that is crazy. The world will tell us that we ought to love our children and be willing to sacrifice everything for our children. And, and okay, yeah, kind of, sort of. Except not. We are to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And in loving God, we are to follow the priorities for our human relationships that He has laid out for us. Which means we believe, according to Scripture, that after God and in obedience to God, our first loyalty is to our spouse. And after God and in His name and in obedience to Him, our next loyalty is our children, our church, our neighbors, and so on and so forth. So, the first so what is where our loyalty belongs. It belongs to God. It belongs to Jesus. We are the thousands upon thousands, the ten thousand upon ten thousand. The second so what is what is God calling you to do right now? God recruits His army. God recruits His civil servants from among us. You are them. We are them. We are His civil oh, Maybe some of you don't want to be in government service. All the bureaucracy and the paperwork and the forms in triplicate. And, uh, but you are. You and me are in a better kingdom than that though. So you're a civil servant. You're a soldier. As am I. The truth is that every one of us is called to play a little bit of that role, of both of those roles at all times. Right? You are called to build the kingdom. That's what Jesus says. Right? We are to store up treasures for ourselves in heaven. We are to do the good things that God has planned in advance for us to do. We are to help the one who is in need giving our coat rather than just saying, hey, bless, be well. Right? We are called to steward the resources that God has given us, investing them and making profit for the kingdom of heaven. And sometimes we are called to do battles for Him. Sometimes that means fighting the Canadian government 
Sometimes it means debating with our neighbors. Sometimes it means being silent and simply serving. Regardless, we are, we are in His kingdom. We are His army. And we are His civil servant. So are you building infrastructure in the kingdom of God? Are you enacting justice in Jesus' name? Are you submitting to the divine covenant with Him? Don't get confused. Don't get confused. Keep your loyalty focused on Jesus. And his kingdom alone. Don't, don't. It is, oh, it's so insidious and terrible right now. Don't confuse a country of this world with, <laughs> with God's kingdom. They're not the same. Canada does not equal the kingdom of heaven. Truly. The United States does not equal the kingdom of heaven. No country equals the kingdom of heaven. Just isn't true. Right? No human leader, me or anybody else, none of us equals Jesus, of course. Right? But we are not loyal to our prime minister or president. We are not loyal to our party, our political party. We are not loyal to our country. We are not loyal to our province. We are not loyal to our company, the company that we work for. We are not loyal to our the brands we buy from over and above our loyalty to God. And so when you vote, when you vote, don't blindly vote for the party that you have always voted for. Don't blindly vote for the party that supposedly has the most connection with Christianity. Don't do that. Look at it. Study. Figure it out. Which is the least worst option this year? And it's okay if your decision is different than mine. That's okay. But vote based on your loyalty to God, not on your loyalty to a party. Same with your shopping. Right? Don't buy brands because you love them and they're so cool. Buy them because you thought about it. I, I know it sounds weird to think, how can I buy a truck in loyalty to my God in heaven? But it's not weird. It's right. You are God's servant and you need to invest the resource He has given you well. And so if you spend $100,000 on a truck that you don't really need just because it's fun for you, then eh, maybe not so loyal to God, maybe more loyal to yourself or to Dodd. Or whatever. Right? But, if you need a $100,000 truck in order to do what God is calling you to do, okay, carry on. Do it. Right? Keep yourself from being confused. Why? Why would you want to keep your eyes focused on the reality that you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and that all, all of your loyalty belongs first and foremost to Jesus, your Lord and Savior? Why? Because what's really the alternative? What's really the alternative? Canada is a great country in a lot of ways. But again, it is probably actually, in proper thinking, one of the less worst countries to be part of. Right? They are all, we, all the countries in the world are broken and messed up. 
There are terrible, terrible things that happen in each of the countries of the world. Not only do we have residential schools where hundreds of, of indigenous people died and suffered and, and, and are still living with the trauma of it, but, but they're finding that the same thing has happened in the United States. Big shock. And in many other places. Not only do we have climate stuff that we're trying to deal with, but so does the rest of the world. Not only do we have injustice that we're dealing with, but so does the rest of the world. So really, do you want to be loyal to a country that is flawed and broken and messed up? Or do you want to be loyal to God and the kingdom of heaven, which is the only perfect kingdom? The only perfect country? Or do you want to settle for something earthly? Why? Because the kingdom of God is so much more than any kingdom on earth. Whether it's corporate, or whether it's environmental, or, or social, or whatever. None of the kingdoms of this earth come close. Why? Because, because Jesus. Queen Elizabeth, she seems like a nice lady, as far as I can tell. I mean, I don't know her personally or whatever, but I do know that Queen Elizabeth has not known me since before I was born. Pretty sure she doesn't know me at all. Also very certain that Queen Elizabeth does not know how many hairs are on my head. Also quite certain that Queen Elizabeth has not given her life for me. I mean, she's not dead, so, you know, that's clear. Right? Queen Elizabeth, as nice as she might be, or, you know, the president, as great as he might be, or whatever, whatever leader... They're not the same as Jesus. Jesus, who is one with God the Father, all of power and authority, the Bible tells us that through Him all things were made and have their being. He became a person like me and died for me. That's a king worth following. Why? Because He did all that. And He is still fighting for me. Even though I was one of the rebels fighting Him. And so were you. So brothers and sisters, this is Christ the King Sunday. Let us remember who our King is and serve Him only. Let's pray. Father in Heaven, thank You so, so very much for sending Your Son to be our Sovereign King. Thank You so very much that He conquered sin and death for us. Lord, help us Help us to serve Him only. May our loyalty lie with Him. May we follow Him wherever He may lead, even as He sacrificed Himself for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.